In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the leaders' meeting. Thank you for our brothers, our sisters, our leaders, our pastors, everyone. We're asking, Lord, that as we get committed to your work, you'll be committed to everything in our lives. Yeah. And you perfect everything concerning every brother, every sister, every leader, every worker in Jesus' name. Yeah. We pray that as we're laboring to help other people move forward, in every area of our lives, we'll move forward as well in Jesus' name. Yeah. And whatever concerns we have, as we concentrate on doing your work, we're praying, oh Lord, you bless your people. Yeah. We'll not regret serving you. Yeah. Even in this life, you'll grant us great rewards. Yeah. And in the life, in the world to come, great will be the reward of your people in Jesus' name. Yeah. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Philippians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 10. It says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord. It will surprise you. As you think about Paul the apostle. It's like Paul the apostle did not know what was going on around him. You see, we get into a problem when we think too much of what goes on around us. At this time, Paul the Apostle was in the prison. He was in the Roman prison. And everything was dark. Everything was weary, wearisome. Everything was cumbersome for him. They chained him to one guard here and the other guard over here. And he didn't have all the liberty that he ought to have. He didn't have all the privileges he ought to have. And yet he said, I rejoiced in the Lord. That you can rejoice in any situation where you are. And that you can look up to the Lord and hope in the Lord and know that whatever you are going through, God is still on the throne. And then he even uses one word here, look at this, but I rejoice in the Lord. Tell me the next word there. Greatly. He said, it's not just a moderate rejoicing, I'm excited about life. In the prison, I'm excited. In this dungeon, I'm excited. With the deep privations, I am excited. And with all the limitations of life that come upon me because of this imprisonment, I still rejoice. I rejoice in the Lord and I rejoice greatly. But now he's telling us something. That now, at the last, your care of me has flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye large opportunity. Here is Paul the Apostle saying, actually, he could have said it another way. You've been negligent. You have not taken care of me. I've been expecting that somebody will come from Philippi and help me here. Don't you people understand? The condition in which I am, and you catch away. I felt lonely. I felt hungry. I felt disappointed. You could have approached it that way, but no, not Paul the Apostle. He said, I know you were careful. I know you were thoughtful. I know you wanted to take care of me, but you large opportunity. And at last you came. Wonderful that you came at last. I'm going to forget all the time you didn't come. I'm going to forget all that time you spent far away from me. And I felt this or that. I now rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Because now at last you sent somebody. And that person has come to give me something. And I'm not blaming you. I'm not putting, I'm not criticizing you. I just knew that you didn't have the opportunity. Look at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatever state I am there to be content. It says, I cannot complain. I will not complain. It says, I'm not going to tell you that why didn't you come earlier? 
What do you need to send that earlier? It says, I have learned in a practical way. I have learned in a positive way. I have learned in a proactive manner. How to be content, how to be satisfied, how to be peaceful, how to be calm in whatever condition I find myself. It says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. Think about that. Everywhere in the prison, out of the prison, everywhere on the evangelistic field and under incarceration, everywhere among friends and among foes, everywhere, wherever it may be. It says everywhere and in all things, you can think about all things imaginable. It says, I have been instructed. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and also to suffer need and then it says i can do tell me all things through christ which strengthens me i'm sure you have quoted that verse before but you quoted it out of context you isolated that verse actually what paul the apostle was saying is i can do all things i can get hungry i can be full I can be pushed, I can be pulled, I can be criticized, I can be battered, I can be praised, I can be whatever, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says negative or positive matters not with me. Dry season, rainy season matters not with me. The friends are there, the foes are there, it says matters not with me. I have learned. To be satisfied, to be peaceful, to be calm, to be cool, to be collected. I've learned to live a life of contentment in whatever situation I find myself. You see, if we can learn this lesson, like Paul the Apostle learned the lesson, our lives will become productive. And it's going to start in your life. Productivity. In a practical way. That you'll be able to stand side by side with Paul the Apostle. Because he said, I have learned in whatever situation I find myself to be contained. I will want to stand side by side with him and say, how did you learn that? How did that come to your life? How were you able to get yourself fixed up that in whatever condition you find yourself up or down or the mountain or in the valley, you're still able to do the will of God until you finish the assignment that God had for you. Paul's testimony will soon become your own testimonial. A statement affirming your own attitude and your consistency in the way you live he testified he said i have learned in whatever stage i am therewith to be content he was writing from the prison on just imprisonment he said doesn't matter i'm content and then he was slandered by people, even preachers. There were people that were preaching the message of envy and a message of oppression, a message of criticism. He said, I had that. He said, I'm all right. And then there were people that were self-centered. He said, I do not have many people like Timothy. All the rest of the people, they care only for themselves. But he said, I'm all right. I'm content. And then we learned about this Paul, the apostle, that he was uh, kind of um, slandered. He was oppressed. He was cheated. And he said, I've been in the deep. I've been among the robbers. And even with the false brethren. And he said, yet I'm content. I'm all right. The things that make people to leave the ministry. And the things that drive people away from their post of duty. Paul the Apostle said, all that came to me and yet I'm all right. You'll be all right. 
I want to look at the word of God tonight with you on the power of contentment. The power of contentment. Somebody that is in a situation that nothing moves you, nothing jolts you, nothing disappoints you, nothing infuriates you, and nothing disquietens you, and nothing disorganizes you. Everything coming from the right, coming from the left, coming from above, and coming from beneath, and you say, I am content. And Paul the apostle said, that was not natural with me. I learned it. If he learned it by the grace of God, you can learn it. And then your life will become positive. That nothing will move you and nothing will disorganize you and nothing will distract your attention. The power of contentment. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the effective power of affirmed contentment. The effective power of affirmed contentment. You see, he affirmed his own contentment. He said, I am content. He affirmed that. And your own can be affirmed. And then you have the effective power of affirmed contentment. Number two, the eternal peril of a cursed covetousness. The eternal peril of a cursed covetousness. You see a person like Paul the Apostle with all the gifts and with all the graces of God upon his life and with all the effectiveness that he had and with all the contacts that he had and all the people that he could give me this, give me this, you ask anything from and yet there was no covetousness in his life because he knew of the eternal peril Perdition, danger, suffering of the people that have covetousness which is accursed. The eternal peril of accursed covetousness. Number three, the everlasting profit of affectionate contentedness. Affectionate contentedness. Not just that you are content, but you have affection with that. You have love with that. You have charity with that. You have good consideration, interpretation of your life, even in that contentedness. The everlasting profit of affectionate contentedness. Number one. Give me number one there. The effective power of affirmed content, contentment. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, reading here from verse 10, the words of Paul the Apostle, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Would you learn how to rejoice? And anything, when something happens, just think about something you can rejoice about. Your life, the opportunities you have, the great privilege you have, the preaching opportunities you have, the converts that are saved through you and the people you are touching their lives when something negative happens when it appears i'm here i'm abandoned then you remember jesus is with you and he says i'll never leave you i'll never forsake you then you remember you have the word of god then you remember the holy spirit the comforter always with you you find something that you can rejoice about that your name is written in the book of life in heaven and so paul the apostle in his in telling us how he learned how to be content he said i rejoiced in the lord greatly then he said that now that now i'm counting my blessings I'm naming them one by one that somebody has now come from Philippi and is giving me this and this gives me joy that now at the last, the care, your care of me has now flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye large opportunity. Try to put a, best, a better construction on the actions of people. 
somebody has delayed coming to a particular place you expected, put a big good construction on that. Somebody should have done something, said something to you positive, but he was in doing that. He didn't do that in time. Put a good construction on that. Somebody has disappointed you. He should have done this. He didn't do that. Put a good construction on this. You know, if you always put a positive construction on what people do, you don't know why they do what they do. Some of them are careless. Some of them are ignorant. Some of them just don't know how to do anything better. Some of them are facing temptation and they're yielding to their temptation. Some of them are facing trials and they're yielding to a trial. Some of them, they have some peculiar problems who cannot tell. And because of that, whatever people do, say, if I were in a situation, if I were in a situation, if I was as ignorant as he is ignorant, if I was uh, dumb as he is dumb, if I was uh, without knowledge, without understanding, as he is without knowledge, without understanding, maybe I'll do the same thing he's doing. They don't know what I'm going through. If I were in the free world and they were the one incarcerated, maybe I would forget the way they are forgotten. Well, you put a good construction on what people do, you'll not be jolted, you'll not be disappointed, you'll be contented. And I pray that this will help us in Jesus' name. It says, not that I speak in respect of want. Well, you make up your mind, I'll never speak in respect of want. I'm not going to make man my provider. I'm not going to make man my protector. Because you see, when you complain like that, you're saying, you didn't do this for me. I would have died if you didn't come. And I would have done that. I would have been this and that. You're shifting your focus from God. Who is your Lord? Who is your creator? Who is your provider? Who is your protector? You're forgetting that the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. And then now you put all the responsibility on this man or this man, this woman, and you say, you know, without you, I will die. That's exaggeration. Without you, I'll not know what you that's exaggeration. Focus your attention on God. He says, I'll never speak in respect of want. You need anything, go to God and go and pray to God and tell the Lord, you are my provider, you are my protector, you are all in all for me. He says, because, look at verse 11, for I have learned. I have learned. You can learn anything you need to learn. Remember many years ago, you didn't know how to write, you learned. Remember many years ago, you didn't know how to read, you learned. Remember, many years ago, you didn't know how to do this or do that, but you learned. Remember many years ago, if when you were hungry, you just cried out when you were a little baby. But you learned how to control your emotion. You learned how to control that pang of hunger. And you learned how to control that thirst. We learn everything in life, any good thing we're going to do, we have to learn. And Paul, the apostle, said, I learned, I have learned lunch in whatever state I am therewith to be content is something that we learn he learned it and we can learn it we're going to learn it in Jesus name and he said now I know when you learn something then you know it then you can do it then you can act it out it says I know both how to be abased and uh, how to abound everywhere and in everything in all things i am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need the effective power of such an attitude that means whatever you need to do you will do and you'll make progress in ministry you don't say i'm hungry now so i cannot go and preach I'm feeling some heat now. I cannot go and preach. I'm feeling the pangs of persecution. I cannot do my duty. He said, I blanch whatever condition in the prison, out of the prison, to be able to stay like that and still do the work I need to do. It gives us power. You'll have that power in Jesus' name. How did he learn? How did he learn contentment? Number one, looking at the brighter side 
of a dark circumstance. Looking at the brighter side of dark circumstances. In the prison, that's dark. Without a friend, that's dark. Without somebody to visit you during visiting hours, that's dark. With all those guards changed to you, that's dark. But learning how to look at the brighter side of dark circumstances. Number two, being satisfied with what you have, your place, your position, and your possession. See, what brings dissatisfaction to us is that we have something, we're not satisfied. We have something, we're not pleased. Because we see that that other person has this, and I don't have that. But you see, Paul the Apostle, he was satisfied with his place. He said, I'm the least of the saints. I'm not even qualified to be called a saint. And yet God had mercy on me. I look at my past and I look at where I should have been now and that I even have this privilege even to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I appreciate what the Lord has done for me. When you appreciate your place, your position, your possession, it will grant you contentment. And then number three, seeing your Lord as ordained by God to fulfill a divine purpose. Paul the Apostle said, all things work together for good to them that are the called and to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. The Lord has called you and the Lord has placed you where you are and you are not where you are by accident. And because you know that this is not accidental, this is where God has placed me he was satisfied, he was alright, in the position in which he was, even in the prison in which he was, because he saw his Lord as ordained by God, and it was to fulfill the divine purpose. Number four, the joy of unexpected opportunity. The joy of unexpected opportunity. It says, while I'm in the prison here, something is happening. And you know what is happening? Come to Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1, here we're reading from verse, uh, we're reading from verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things that happened unto me are falling out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He said, if you hear that I'm in the prison, don't make any conclusion yet. Don't pass any comment yet. I want to tell you that the things that happened to me, they have fallen out to be to the fortress of the gospel. It says, so that my bonds in Christ are now manifest in all the palace and then in all the places. And look at it. It says, my imprisonment, my incarceration, my persecution has actually yielded fruit because now, because of this imprisonment, all those guards that are chained to me, I say, do you know why I'm chained? Do you know why you are my guard? And do you know why you are here? Why I'm in the prison? He says, no, you're not a criminal. Uh-uh. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I preach the gospel. And I preach that Jesus Christ died. And he rose again. And that he changes lives. And he's coming again. And he's going to take us to heaven. That's what people need to understand. Do you understand my God? Do you understand that you can be born again? Do you understand that even now, as you are chained to me before you leave, the joy of salvation can come to your heart? And that one repented. And then he wrote, he said, the things that happened to me. A being for the furtherance of the gospel. And they change those guards once in a while. You know, they change these people to him now, and then they, they spawn again, and then they chain another set, and then he asks the same question Do you know why I'm here? And do you know why you are here? He preaches the gospel as they're taking their turns and taking their turns. The people are getting born again, and then he now tells, Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 22. Chapter 4, verse 22. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. In Caesar's household, all those guards, 
all those people, how would, how would Paul the Apostle have reached them? There's no way he could have reached them, only because they came to him and they were chained to him. They were on duty. And before they finished their duty, they were born again. And if something happens to you, and it makes many people to know the Lord, I think whatever it is that happens to you, that's a glorious thing. And it is going to give you reward in eternity in Jesus' name. And so the joy Paul the Apostle had was the joy of an expected opportunity. Number five, looking at the eternal and minimizing the temporal. Looking at the eternal and minimizing the temporal. He said, Heaven is a long, it's going to take us a long time, eternity. It's going to be forever and ever and ever. And so, whatever happens here, this for a few days, whatever happens here, this for a few weeks, a few months, a few years, and because this is temporal, and it is temporary, and it is very short, and it is minimal, I minimize that, I maximize and extend the things that are going to be in eternity. And because he was looking at the eternal, and he minimized the local, the temporal, the things that are temporary, the visible. That's why I was content. Number six, never comparing yourself with anyone else. You see in the writings of Paul the Apostle, he never compared himself with other people. Why is it I'm going through all this? How about Peter? How about John? How about James? How about the brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why am I the only one that is going to bear all the persecution, all the suffering of the ministry? No comparison. We're coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're looking at verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that compare, that commend themselves. We dare not make ourselves of the number of the people that compare themselves with others and they are commending themselves, but they measure, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, tell me, are not wise. You'll always be dissatisfied when you compare yourself with other people. They have this, I don't have. They are granted that opportunity, I'm not granted. They are big, I am small. They go here, I'm not able to go there. Comparison will bring discontent. But when you understand that he is where he is, praise the Lord. I am where I am, praise the Lord. He has a big stature, praise the Lord for him. I have a smaller stature. I'm able to go through entrances that he is not able to go through. I'm able to sit or the chair is not able to sit on. I have a small stature because of that people are not threatened by my appearance. You can always put a positive construction on who you are, on what you have, on what you don't have, and then you are happy and you are content. And so Paul the Apostle never compared himself with other people because he knew what he had and what he was was the appointment of the Lord. Number seven, counting his blessings one by one. Counting his blessings one by one. I received mercy and God enabled me and put me in the ministry and i didn't have all this teaching from man god himself taught me and he put me in trust he was always counting his blessing and because he was always counting his blessing that's why there's no regret in his life no sorrow in his life and he could say i rejoice greatly I pray that this same attitude the Lord will grant unto us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 33. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 33. It says in verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. He said, that's the secret. I've coveted no man's home, no man's house, no man's apartment, no man's silver, 
no man's riches, no man's wealth, no man's opportunity, no man's husband, no man's servant, no man's wife. What they have, praise the Lord for them. What I have might be small, might be limited. Praise the Lord. I have what I have. And it says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. You don't, co you don't covet other people's opportunities other people's privileges, other people's ease of life, other people's luxury, other people's friendliness, other people, whatever it is they have, thank God for them. God has given me all that he knows I have, I ought to have, and what will be a benefit to my life, and what will make me useful. Maybe if I have what they have, it might lessen my usefulness. We're looking at point number two now, the eternal peril of accursed covetousness. Eternal peril of accursed covetousness. We're coming to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20 and verse 21. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. That's why they couldn't evangelize as much as Timothy evangelized. That's why they were not available even though Timothy was available. That's why they were not useful as Timothy was useful. Timothy was not even as strong as the rest of the people. He was fragile. He was feeble. He was timid. He was fearful. And Paul, the apostle, knew that. And yet he said, I have no man like this man. You might think he's fragile. You might think he's feeble. You might think he's not powerful. You might think that he's, you know, he's timid. And we might need to, you know, kind of pump him up a little bit and tell him that we have not received the spirit of fear, of timidity, but of love and of a strong mind. We might have to do that, but he's always available. All the other people that are stronger we cannot find them because they're covetous because they're thinking of what can i get out of this what can i get out of that look at philippians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 18 philippians chapter 3 we're reading from verse 18 it says for many work of whom i have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul the Apostle said that many other people, contentment is not in their lifestyle. Contentment is not in their dictionary. Contentment is not their way of life. It says many of them walk, and I've told you about them. I'm even telling you now weeping that they're the enemies of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and who glory in their shame, who mind as the things, the things of this world, the things money can buy, the things people can resolve, the things people can see, earthly things, the things that perish with the world, that's their concern. And that is their pursuit. That's all they're looking for. It says they could have been useful, but they are not. They could have been great preachers, but they are not. And they could have been wonderful in the kingdom of God, but they are not. They could have been instrumental to bringing many souls into the kingdom, but they are not. Why? Because of that accursed covetousness. I'm sure you remember Joshua chapter 7. When last did you look at that? Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading here from verse 21. Joshua chapter 7 verse 21. When I saw that's the, that's the problem with people. They cannot take their mind away from whatever their eyes see. When I saw among uh, the spoils, a goodly Babylonish garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I, what's the next word there? 
coveted them. I saw, I coveted them. I couldn't take my mind away from that. Look at all that person is wearing. I can't take my mind away from that. Look at that, what that person has. I can't take my eyes away from that. And look at the car is riding. When did he buy this? When did this model come? I couldn't take my mind away from that. They didn't marry. Look at the wife of that person. I couldn't take my mind away from that. Look at the husband of this person. I couldn't take my mind away from that. I saw that and my mind was that. It blotted out everything from my sight. All I could think about was the goodly Babylonish garment and the wedge of gold and all the other things he said. I coveted them and took them and behold their heat in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And so what well, you know he perished. I pray you will not perish. I thought somebody there would say good amen. amen. We're looking at Isaiah. Terrible scene when a pastor becomes covetous. Terrible scene when a leader becomes covetous. Terrible scene when a preacher begins to compare himself with the people of the world and he's saying, you know, they have that and I want to have that too. Your calling is not their calling. Your position is not their position. And what the Lord has given you is not what the Lord has given them. If you knew their end, you'll pity them. Isaiah chapter 56. And here we're reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 10. Is watchmen are blind. The things of this world blindfolds the minds of the people who are supposed to be watchmen. Is watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs that they cannot bark. It says sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs that cannot have, tell me, enough. No matter what they have, they cannot have enough. And that's the attitude of the world. That's the spirit of the world. And you try to increase whatever you are giving them. And for the moment, they are alright. For the moment, they are satisfied. Until they see another person that is getting more than they are getting. And they cannot have enough. They go out now, they buy some clothes. It's look, it looks like they are going to empty the store. They are going to empty the, the place where they buy the clothes. You know, they buy this and buy this and buy this. And while they are going, the salesperson there says, Madam, come and look at this one. I didn't know that was there. Okay, put that in the basket. And then as well, Madam, have you looked at the section of the shoes? I didn't. So you have section for shoes here? Yes, we do. And then, this one is new. This one is modern. This one is psychedelic. And this one, if in fact this one is very good. And then okay, put that in. And then while you are going, Madam, this kind of clothes you bought, the color. This other thing will match it very well. You didn't see that. Look at this. Uh, sit down. Try it. And they, and they never get out of that place. And they're supposed to be preachers. They're supposed to be leaders. The things their mind are thinking of about this, about this, about that. You see Achan, what he got, he couldn't use. How do you use a Babylonish garment in Israel? How do you use that? How do you take that Babylonish garment with all the embroidery and everything? How do you bring it out and Joshua will see you? And which occasion are you going to go that you are going to use that thing and you are part of the army of the children of Israel and Joshua will not see you? So he went to hide it. How many things do we have that we can't use? How many things do we possess that we cannot use and we're still possessing and possessing and possessing them and yet we're not able to use them? That's why it says in this verse 11, yea, they are greedy dogs which cannot, which can never have enough. It says they are shepherds that cannot understand. Leaders, pastors, preachers, shepherds. And then it goes on to say, they all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his 
quarter. And that's a peril of covetousness. The Lord will deliver us in Jesus' name. In Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 19. Ezekiel 13. Reading from verse 19. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley? It becomes so bad that even for little sin, we give up the ministry. We give up our opportunity. We give up our opportunities. It says, will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for a piece and for pieces of bread? And it said to slay the souls that should not die. The people that should not die, they are dying because we cannot follow them up. The people that should not perish, they are perishing because we are not preached to them. We don't have the time. We only were thinking of, I have this business, I must have another one. I have this out, uh, enterprise, I must have another one. I have that outfit, I must have another one. I meet, you know, we came to service and then I meet my brothers. Ah, my brother, what are you doing? Are you still in that uh, water, pure water business? Ah, <laughs> the pure water business is running and then the poultry is running and then this how many businesses do you have now can i count one two three i think i'm on number six when did you start how did you do it how did you register that and then we forget everything we've heard and we forget all our consecration this person a fellow brother this person a fellow sister he has this he has this he has established that registered that and is doing this and is never available now he's to abuja now he's going to port Harcourt. now he's going to ibada now he's going to his uh, local place his uh, state of origin he's establishing this and this and this and then your mind is gone and paul the apostle said i'm not like that I'm not like that because I've learned to be content in whatever state, station I find myself. I know what the Lord has called me for. He has not called me for that business and that business and that enterprise. What he has called me for, I'm going to concentrate on. I pray you'll come back in Jesus' name. That all the things of this life will not take you away from the thing that the Lord himself has appointed you to do. Well, don't misunderstand me. If you have enough food and you're able to feed yourself, educate your children, and make your family live a moderately convenient life, that's enough. Then you can push out everything you have, your time, your talent, and all your resources. You put everything into the work of the Lord. You'll be rewarded in eternity in Jesus' name. But if you spend all your time all your energy, all your resources, everything, and you gamble with your life and gamble with your ministry when Christ comes. Must I go and empty handed? Not a soul with which to greet him. Must I meet my Savior's soul? That empty handed, you come before the Lord because business ate up your life, because enterprises ate up your life. And because all the things of this world will not allow you to push in everything you've got, all your life, all your talent, and all your skill into the work of the Lord, you are running the rat race. And you never meet up with those rats because they're more clever than you are. You'll keep running and it's the mirage of life. I pray you'll not be like that. Somebody give me a good, good amen. Amen. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, here we're reading from verse 1. Uh, you know many people that become false prophets, there's the reason why, many of them. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves, tell me, sweet destruction. And many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 
and through what? Through, tell me. If you are not afraid, through, through covetousness, preachers, prophets, leaders, through covetousness, shall they with faint words make what? Merchandise of you. Can you think of a leader? Instead of following up the souls, it's introducing business to members of the church. It's looking for business partners, members of the church. And can you imagine that the capital, the money, the little money that some of these members have, they contribute. They say they are doing local banking, whatever. And it is a so-called pastor, a so-called leader that is involved in that. And then we we'll begin to hear later, sir, help us. We're in trouble. Say so what? All my income I gave to our pastor. Why? Because he said there's a kind of business. It will generate 20%. It will generate 25%. I cannot find capital. I cannot find interest. Problem. Because of covetousness, that leader is put in charge of people and is put in charge to help them and to help them to know the Lord. But instead of helping them to know the Lord, it's not duping them. It's stealing from them because of covetousness. And here, Peter, the apostle Peter said, they'll make merchandise of you. I pray the Lord will not allow you to do that. And it says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their and their damnation slumbereth not. You see, covetousness is a great problem. Covetousness uh, makes people dissatisfied in life. Whatever they have, there's discontent. And the world operates in that. You see how the world operates? The world will advertise this and advertise that so that no matter what you have, you'll be dissatisfied with what you have and then go after what they're advertising. It's like that in politics. It's like that in business. It's like that in the advertisement, advertisement industry. Covetousness breeds inordinate desires. There's something in you. I want, I want, I want. Why don't you allow the spirit of God to quench that thing? Quell that thing. Stop that thing. So that your mind will rest on Christ. And your mind will rest on the work the Lord has given you. Covetousness breeds avarice. It breeds worldliness. And it brings fraud. That's why people commit fraud. They're not satisfied with their earnings. They're not satisfied with their salary. They're not satisfied with what they are getting out of the work they're doing. Fraud will come in. And covetousness leads to backsliding. Little by little, they drop the work of God. Little by little, they drop the Bible study. Little by little, they drop the revival. Little by little, they drop Sunday service. Eventually, they are off. Covetousness leads to abandonment of duty abandonment of duty and they are never early in the meeting they are never available at the meeting a, a few minutes more a few minutes more a few minutes more maybe the customers will come now just about 30 minutes more are so close maybe they'll come just another 15 minutes more and eventually uh, they come at the end of the meeting and when they do that over and over and over they cannot pray again and they do not have any meaningful quiet time because covetousness brings a abandonment of duty it brings stealing covetousness covetousness will bring stealing 
and the lie for people the people that do not check themselves do not control themselves and they do not modify moderate the things they're looking for and the things they're running after even the churches everything is not prosperity 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 it brings covetousness and eventually it brings chilling brings greed in the lives of people greed that's the reason why we need to come side by side with Paul the Apostle and say, Lord, help me. He learned it, I will learn it. Somebody there, I will learn it. And it brings betrayal. You betray other people. Into the hands of the people you think might give you one thing or the other. And it brings bribery and corruption. It's covetousness that brings the bribery and the corruption. And brings eventually damnation. You remember Lot? That's covetousness that led him where he got to. You remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? That's where covetousness led them to. You remember Balaam? Do you remember Achan, Ahab, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha? It's covetousness. You remember the rich fool. He ran to the Lord. Lord, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord told him he couldn't. You know why? Because of the riches. Judas is carried. That man had all the messages he could hear. That man had the way to heaven. The narrow path, the narrow way that leads to life eternal. He couldn't make it. Demas, he has forsaken me, having loved this present world. The eternal peril of the accursed covetousness. Point number three. The everlasting profit of affectionate contentedness. Everlasting profit of affectionate contentedness we're coming to philippians chapter 4 philippians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 11 philippians 4 11 i pray the lord will translate this to our lives verse 11 not that i speak in respect of want are you going to make up your mind that the things you speak about will not be for personal gain will not be for personal profit will not be for what can i get out of this what what can i gain out of this not that i speak in respect of want for i have learned in whatever state i am whatever state i am there we to be content i know both how to ab to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It said in verse 11, I have learned. It said in verse 12, I am instructed. I'm still being instructed. Uh, let's uh, go to familiar ground genesis chapter 13. in genesis chapter 13 we're reading from verse 8. genesis chapter 13 verse 8 and abraham said unto lord let there be no strife i pray thee between me and thee and between my heart's men and thy heart's men, for we are brethren. Lord didn't remember, we are brethren. But Abraham remembered, we are brethren. There are people that forget that we are brethren. And they do things that hurt. And they do things that will make another person poor, make him to lose everything he's got, make him to lose his possession. 
The covetousness takes over their lives that they do not remember were brethren. They become cruel. They become terrible because they forget we are brethren. No consideration at all. It's not the whole land before thee. Verse 9. Separate thyself. I pray thee from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Look at Abraham, the older one. Actually, is the one that received the promise of God. And Lord did not have any promise from the Lord, only because he followed Abraham. That's how he became blessed. And now Abraham was willing to yield and willing to bend and willing to give up whatever it was. And he said, Lord, don't let us fight. What are we fighting about? Herds, animals, property, whatever. He says, that shouldn't be. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Make your choice. Look at verse 10. And Lord lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered. Everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the guardian of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar, and Lord chose him, all the plain of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and separated themselves, one, the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward, tell me, Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Then look at Abraham, and the Lord said unto, unto Lot, unto who? Or to Abraham, that man lost the voice of God, fellowship with God, and the light coming from the Lord. God will not even deal with him directly. And Lord, and sorry, and the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lord had separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, Eastward, westward, everything. For all the land which thou seest to thee, will I give it unto thy seed. How long? Forever. The blessing is on the side of those who have contentment. The Lord is on the side of those who have contentment. The people that have covetousness and greed, dissatisfaction, never satisfied with whatever they've got, they're going to lose those things they even think they're trying to keep. And let's look at chapter 14. The affectionate contentedness of Abraham. Eventually, uh, there was something that happened to Sodom and it took a lot and his wives and all that he had away. And it was this same Abraham that went to rescue him. Chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. That is, Abraham giving the Christianic tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons, those are my people, citizens, and take the goods to thyself. Abraham did not ask him. He said, all the booties, all the spoils, all the goods, 
all the riches, all the wealth, everything. Because you've gone to the battle and you've got all this. You can take everything. Look at Abraham, verse 22. And Abraham said unto the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe lashed, and that I will not take anything that is thine. Tell me the rest. Lest thou, king of Sodom, lest thou, the leader of defiled people, lest thou, the king of depraved people, Lest thou, the one that does not know my God, the God of Abraham, lest thou shouldest say, I made Abraham rich. Can you reject something like that? You say you are saved. Can you reject that? You are sanctified. Can you reject that? And you say, you're a leader. You're a real child of God. And they're trying to give you something. The people of the world, okay, you go to your church and, you know, you, you put your heads and shoulders and neck and everything into the work of the church. And look at where you're, okay, come now. And then I'll give you this. To spite your God. And to tell you that what your God could not do for you, at least you see now, we're able to do for you. And can you say, thank you very much, hold on to what you have. Lest thou shouldest say that you made Abraham rich. I pray that our conviction will be very strong. And when it comes to rejecting what comes from the wrong source, we'll be able to reject in Jesus' name. Genesis chapter 19, you know the story, but I'm going to show you something in this story. Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 26. In verse 26 it says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became, tell me, a pillar of salt. You know what? Lot lost all the cattle in the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not only that, he lost all those herdsmen, all his servants. He lost them in the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not only that, he lost his wife. Just coming out of Sodom, the wife looked back, became a pillar of salt. And then he had how many daughters left? Tell me, two daughters. He lost those daughters. Hold on. Oh, but I thought those daughters, they were still alive. Read the story. I'm reading to you here in uh, chapter 19. You look at chapter 19 of uh, Genesis. And then we're looking at verse, 30, and verse 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old. And there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make a father drink wine, and we will and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed unto our father. And so the story goes on: they made the father drunk. And the father, Lord, did not know when the elder one slept with him. And when the younger one slept, look at verse 37. And the firstborn bear his son and called his name, tell me, Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day, Moab. Verse 38. And the younger, she also bear his son and called his name what and then the same is the father of the children of what Ammon until this day Moab Ammon Moab Ammon remember them Moab and Ammon we're coming to Zephaniah 
Zephaniah. I'm reading from chapter 2. Zephaniah is near the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 2. And we're reading from verses 9 and 10. Tell me the name of the names of those two sons again. Moab and okay, say it in unison. One, two, three, go. Okay. Zephaniah chapter 2. We're reading from verse 9. Are you there? Okay. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely, tell me, Moab shall be as Sodom. And the children of, tell me, Ammon shall be as Gomorrah. Even the breeding of nestles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation and the residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them this shall they have for their pride because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. Lot lost everything. Lost the cattle. Lost the herdsmen. Lost his wife. Lost those daughters. Those daughters came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Sodom and Gomorrah never came out of them. The pollution. The incest. The immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah never came out of them and the result of that Moab and Ammon even till almost the end of the Old Testament they were still linked or Sodom and Gomorrah you don't want to perish you don't want your family to perish you want to come to the side of Paul the Apostle and you want to say Whatever it will take, all these things that are attracting me and distracting me, blot them out of my sight. So that, like Paul the Apostle, I will learn to be content with whatever I have. And then we keep on doing the work of God and money will not take the work of God from your hand. Business will not take the work of God from your hand. After all, we're going to leave all those things in the world here. That's what the Lord is telling us in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're reading here from verse 6. It says, from verse 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we're carrying nothing out and having food and raiment let us be their ways content but they that will be rich by all means they that will be rich by covetousness and grabbing what belongs to other people they that will be rich by fraud by bribery and corruption, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith they are backsliding and they are pierced themselves through with many sorrows but thou O man of God woman of God child of God but thou servant of God but thou O man of God flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience and meekness and the Lord will be with us in Jesus name Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, 
refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God and to, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured a seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, neither nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. Can we say that together? The Lord is my helper. Can you say that again? The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. And I will not fear. And I will not fear. What man shall do unto me? The Lord is saying, take your heart away from men. They'll oppress you. Take your heart away from that rich man. Take your heart away from that person who wants to boss over you. And wants to destroy your life. They want to hold your life in their hand. Like they pick the flower out from the branch and squeeze your life. And then they want your destiny to depend on them. Because you're looking up to them. Because they know you're not happy until they give you something. Because they know they are the benefactor. They are the people that can make your life happy. You say, I take my life away from their hands. I put it in the hands of God. If I'm going to be happy, God will make me happy. If I'm going to have anything, God will give me that. Because he has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Whatever they want to withdraw, let them withdraw. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And the church said... Rise up and let's talk to the Lord. Let's talk. We're already going to pray today that this disease of covetousness, this depravity of covetousness, and this poison of covetousness, the Lord will take away from us and he'll give us contentment, a calm heart, a peaceful mind that will come in your soul. You are calm in your mind. You are not agitated. You are not worried. You are not anxious. You are not afraid. And you are not looking up to a man as if a man, a woman was your God. You are saying, Lord, I look up to you. I've learned and I'm learning. I've learned I'm going to learn. I've learned I'm instructed to be satisfied in every situation. Right, left, up, down. I have, I don't have, I rest in the Lord. Be free of covetousness.